Hello and welcome to the British Sitcom History Podcast. My name is Alan. Joining me, as always, is Gareth. Hello! Today, Gareth, we are taking on old-school classic The Army Game. Am I right in thinking this was ITV's first ever sitcom? That is, uh, seems to be the case, yes. Uh, not, okay. not the first sitcom, but it's certainly one of the first generation of sitcoms and one of the first really big... Uh, famous popular ones yeah and, and and credited as itv's first made by granada from the north we're going to get into this as we as we progress through the uh through our discussion but it, it's a little bit complicated isn't it because the cast changed quite significantly after the first series do you want to just give us a little bit of an yeah. overview of how this when it was made and how the production worked yeah so it, it started in 1957 mm. and there seems to be a bit of um variation in sources of what qualifies as a first series, second series, etc. Right. I know it started out as a fortnightly sitcom. Oh, that's interesting. For non-British people, that means every two weeks. <laughs> yeah, I did discover that quite recently, that American people don't use the word fortnight. Anyway, that is unusual. But then again, that's purely because 60 years later, we're used to yeah. a weekly format. But I guess there was no reason that that had to be the case. And, and you know, quite quickly, it, it became popular enough that they switched it to weekly anyway. Mm. Uh, but very, very beginnings, it was every two weeks. And bear in mind that you rehearse Monday to Friday, record on a Saturday, and then maybe have Sunday off, like, or whatever, it, you know, however it works. Rehearsals throughout the week, and yeah. then a day for filming. It's a pretty full-on process. If you're doing that for a six-week stint, mm. it's just a nice little intense job. This series ran for 39 episodes. Mm, right. This was a, 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 a weekly gig. And so maybe they were thinking at first, like, that is that is too much to try and do every week. It's too much work. Yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> a full year commitment, basically. September to June, they seem to run. Uh, so this the, first the series, series was, you said, 1957? Yes. And then just every year is from that from that point basically. So yeah, September to June, June, like the school year, they would put us Yeah, they out, would have, have the summer off. They would have a couple again. of months off and then start again, yeah. Interesting. And it was so it's four series, right? Of the, the original army game. We'll talk about spin offs and things later. That's how I reckon it. Yes, as I say, some think some sources will call it five and have the first series split into two. Uh, and that makes things a bit complicated when you're trying to work out about the cast and who's changed where mm. and all that sort of thing. And to add to that, in terms of the cast confusion, you know, we have our core cast of usually six, seven people. Yeah. So to, to just to let everyone know, series one the, and series two, there are only a handful of episodes that still exist. Yes. Series three is one where, like, you've got everything. And then series four, there's some from there as well. Okay. Um, but the original cast, series one and some of two cast... There's not a lot of episodes remaining, and of the ones that are remaining, yeah, every single one has at least one of the main cast missing. Okay, either replaced in some plot relevant way, or just casual way, or that person's just not there. Mm. So I I suspect that you know you're doing this for thirty nine weeks a year. You you're allowed a bit of time off. <laughs> you know yeah, you're allowed to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it, and I don't even. And like I say, it seems every one that I've seen has at least one person missing. Maybe it was just on rotation. Uh, but then sometimes they handle that better than others. So one of the earlier episodes, for example, the major who runs the camp is not mm. there. And so a new officer is brought in to run it. And that's the whole plot. This new guy comes in. He's a bit useless, et cetera, et cetera. I see. But then there's other times where, and in fact, the episode we're going to look at. Series one, episode 15, Rax. Uh, Michael Medwin isn't in it. He's the corporal of the little troop of our, our right. band of heroes. And that means that Alfie Bass's character, Bootsy, kind of takes his role. He's the one leading the group. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's not really his normal thing. And so sometimes they just sort of transition that. There's another episode early on where they bring in Dick Emery, who's, and he's obviously yeah. just playing the Alfie Bass role, the Bootsy role, okay. uh, albeit on a different name. Like, you wouldn't do that today. You're like, you, but no. it's it's... We've talked before about how early sitcom is very much a theatrical production being filmed. And that's mm. what you would do in a theatrical production. You'd be on every night, and then some nights the understudy would be on. 
Yeah, I, I also think it might lend a bit to radio as well. Uh, mm-hmm, I think you yeah. get away with a lot more on radio. You just get someone who sounds kind of the same, and nobody really questions it. Whereas with the visual element as well, it's you identify with the people a lot more, I think. Well, let's just make a point about how we're going to structure this episode for our listeners. So yeah, the, the episode we're looking at is Series 1, Episode 15, which is Racks. And we'll talk about that in quite a lot of detail, as we usually do. But as you described, a lot of those early episodes are missing. So this is something of a rarity. So we're going to talk about that initial cast, which could probably be characterized as the ones that went on to be in the Carry On films. But then what we want to do after that is talk about the later series, series three, where we've watched quite a lot of episodes, where it's almost entirely a different cast. So we'll sort of cover that in the second half. So for the first half, shall we, shall we launch into our episode and kind of go off from there? Sure. Do you want me to give you a little bit of background first? Yeah, go on. The, the show was created by a writer called Sid Collin. And Sid Collin, you know, he was wrote for all the usual suspects, 50s and 60s and the radio and everything. Um, yeah. He actually worked a lot with Frankie Howard kind of later on. And uh, he wrote quite a few sitcoms in that period, in the 50s. Not a lot of them are really known now or have survived or anything like this. This is the one that carried over okay. uh, from, from all those decades. But apparently it was inspired by a film called Private's Progress, made in 1956. Okay. And that, that that is a comedy film, but it follows a soldier conscripted into the army, and he has to kind of, you see his progress throughout the, the thing. And the first act of that is him in, like, basic training. It's kind yes. of like Full Metal Jacket, but with less okay. um, murder. And, <laughs> and, uh, and then he goes on to be in the army and gets involved in some sort of nefarious plots and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But Sid Collins saw this and thought, oh, there's something there, that kind of first act. And... Playing the hard-headed sergeant major type character in that film is William Hartnell. William Hartnell, who is plays the sergeant major in this first series. Yes. So he literally just gone. I like that character. Let's mm-hmm. let's bring that in. Let's do that. Uh, so yeah. So that's basically where the show came from. That's the concept. It was made for TV. It didn't come from radio. Okay. So back to our episode. Now the episode title is Racks. And that's mm. W R A C S. Yes, I thought I'd ask, I'd ask you how what this is. You're you are a military man, as we all know. <laughs> you are a... Well, I mean, ultimately, what it is that, that we'll get into the plot line of the episode in a minute, but it's about some female um, army cadets, privates, and the the racks. They were referred to as racks, and in real life, as far as I can tell, I was a little confused by the second A. In real life, it was the Women's Royal Army Corps. Which was uh, during national service after the Second World War. That was essentially the, the, the core in which women served. You, you probably know that the Queen served. She was a driver during the Second World War. Mm-hmm. And that was the Auxiliary Territorial Service, the ATS. That's what she was in. And the RACs, uh, they were basically the successor organization to the ATS after the war. Mm-hmm. Now, I've got to be honest with you. I haven't got an answer for why there's a second A in this episode title. Because I Googled <laughs> it, and the only thing that came up with that with that double A was something to do with Australia. Uh, it's nothing to do with this episode has got nothing to do with Australia. So I don't know whether that's an affectation or whether they weren't allowed to use the official title. I don't know. I don't know. But it, but it is it's the Women's Royal Army Corps. That's what the episode is dealing with. Yeah, in the script they say racks. I mean if it They refer to these women as racks. As in, yeah, she yeah, is a rack, you are a rack, so. they are racks. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, can I can I ask you a bit about national service and all that? So, so just to just to the, basically this whole sitcom is set in the world of national service it's they are at nether hopping supply mm-hmm. ordnance depot it was a, a supply ordnance depot is basically just we we store a load of it's like a, you, know, you know in you know in yes minister they are What's the what's the name of the ministry that, that Jim Hacker is minister for administrative affairs or something that is <laughs> yeah. that means everything and nothing? That's exactly what the supply ordnance depot is. It's sort of something that's sort of important but never gets the headlines and you kind of need but you don't need and you know it's it's a catch all really. Yeah, and so these guys are you know the whole point is that they don't want to be there. They don't want to do any work. They're just they're scheming and trying to get off. Well, that's conscription for you. When people say yeah. bring back national service, like we don't want an army full of people who don't want to be there. That's not going to be effective. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you know what it reminded me of? Something we were talking about recently it was porridge. 
you know they're mm-hmm. trapped there they don't want to be there and they're scheming to get one over on the on yeah, the authority point. figure who really has a lot of power over them and can make them you know give them terrible punishments do you know what that is spot on i've i've been trying to make comparisons to dad's army all week and <laughs> finding very few you nailed it it's, this is porridge this is porridge not not dad's army well i'll tell you the the other big comparison that i made which shocked me slightly actually because I've I've never really seen much of the army game before, so it's fairly new to me. How much um, it ain't half hot mum owes to this? It is really the exact same setup. It's just you know that yeah, kind of yeah, the of hard nosed sergeant major, and then this bunch of misfits, even with a similar kind of the stupid mm-hmm. one and the camp one and and all that sort of stuff. It's bordering on plagiarism. <laughs> I was I'm shocked, <laughs> frankly. I I and because I hadn't seen the army game, it had never struck me. But I can't believe they got away with that like 15 years later. <laughs> I would have thought when, when It Ain't Half Upman came out in the late 70s, then people would remember the army game, wouldn't they? Certainly. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, like we say with Porridge, it's it's great to have your characters trapped somewhere. Trapped with people they wouldn't necessarily get on with. Um, mm-hmm. You know, forced by an authority figure that they have to fight against. Little victories, all that sort of thing. Yeah. So let, let's just get into the episode, though. Let's uh, when, and, and it opens with the, your Granada title card from the north granada mm-hmm. and yes. manchester and these this first series it always opened with william hartnell kind of shouting at the troops he's like you're in the army shouting now the come screen, on. yeah yeah later series have this kind of disembodied heads vibe to their uh, opening credits where they give yes. you the cast but just in terms of the opening credits here uh, and like i was saying about the missing cast every now and then um these opening credits have as far as i can tell they have three named people uh, in yeah. the opening credits. So it'll be William Hartnell, Alfie Bass, Jeffrey Sumner, or Michael Medwin. Yeah. And it seems to have three, depending on who's in that episode, because it was different every one that <laughs> I saw. Uh, but I found that interesting. Like, William Hartnell was always in that list. Like, he was the... And, like, none of these guys were established stars or anything. Uh, they were all right. sort of, maybe not unknowns, but, you know, they weren't they weren't brought in to lend a, a name to the Well, show. let's talk about William Hartnell, then, because I guess... I guess He's probably the most famous name because he went on to play Doctor Who, and that's you know that 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 ascribes a certain level of celebrity to anyone who plays that role. Hmm. And you said he'd been in that Privates on Parade film before. Privates Parade, but was yeah. but sorry, private, what's Privates on Parade? Is that in a carry that's, on? That's film? in your personal collection. I don't know. <laughs> It might be, you know. <laughs> um, it's a Robin Asquith film. <laughs> um, so, so he wasn't the star then. He, this is obviously before Doctor Who. He was just a yeah. Tell me, he was a jobbing actor, Alan. Um, yeah, he was. Um, I, I, William Hartnell is quite an interesting story. He was a you know, an, born in 1908, right? But uh, illegitimate, no father. You know, it's kind of as a teenager, just knocking around in some sort of murky criminal underworld, sort of petty crime and things like that. And then, right. uh, so this is what I was reading, uh, just doing a bit of Wikipedia research, you know, but. Um, and uh, because he's a who a who person, I'm sure that there's loads of people out there who kind of know the ins and outs of his life story. Yeah. But basically, it says here that at the age of 16, he was sort of taken in by an art collector named Hugh Blaker, a sort of middle-aged art collector, sort oh, of I... became an unofficial guardian for him and sort of set mm-hmm. him up, paid for him to go to drama school and stuff like that. Now, is this just a different time, or does that sound really <laughs> I weird, mean, dodgy? I, I'm, yeah, I mean, I'm reading into that. Perhaps unfairly to all parties, but you know, like that, I want to that, see that, the that best scene in with Neil and I, which but... says he came up here with his nephew. Yeah, that's him. <laughs> <laughs> so even when William Hartnell got married, uh, they lived in a house that was owned by this Hugh Blaker guy. Like he supported. It's like Great it, Expectations, isn't it? Well, that was it. Is that it's a, a wholesome it's a sort story. of a old Victorian holdover? Look, we someone has to look after the waifs because the, the state doesn't do it. And so we have philanthropists and that sort of thing. Or is it weird? I'm not sure. Mm. But anyway, that that was how William Arnold um, kind of got his foot up uh, and, and managed to begin a career as an actor. And then made the usual journey through that kind of acting world, you know, to just build a reputation. Did serve in the army during the war. Um, he was discharged, or I don't know what the word is, but he, he had a nervous breakdown and had to be okay. kind of sent out. Like, so he didn't... The war. I think that yeah, did, did happen in the Second World War. Yeah, yeah. Like, well, what I mean by that is in the First World War, they just shot you. Yeah. In the Second World War, they were slightly more sympathetic. 
So yeah, Army Game was his first regular role on TV, which is not that surprising because TV, you know, was only just getting going in terms of regular sure. series and stuff. So, yeah. like, uh, but he, he, so he'd had a, the odd appearance here and there, obviously. As but he'd be fifty then. That I'm time. doing the maths. He'd be nearly fifty there. Yeah, fifty when the show started, maybe forty nine. Mm. And and that and this is he was a star because of this show. He was well known because mm. of it. Uh, mm. And the Doctor Who thing came at what sixty three, so it was a few years mm. later. Yeah, but Doctor Who wasn't what it you know it was. It was a that new was show. the first was a new Doctor science Who, fiction yeah, yeah. show. It's not like it's not like now when there's a big who who's going to be the next Doctor Who that everyone's excited about it and it's everyone knows what that means for someone's career, don't they? I wouldn't imagine it was the same for William Hartnell. Well, I heard that uh, he he took the role Doctor Who. Because it was so different that like he'd been typecast as this kind of hard-headed yes. policeman, drill sergeant type mm. character. That was what he played all the time. And this character was different, a sort of kind of wacky, eccentric wizard kind of man. And so yeah. he he sort of jumped at the chance to do it. It does seem like he just hated his everything he did, though. <laughs> He's a very famously a very grumpy man, and you see him being yeah. really just... He just seems to hate his life <laughs> and everything he did. <laughs> but there you go. That was, that was life in the... 60s. <laughs> okay, fair enough. All right, so let's go through this episode. So we, we the opening sequence is it's a kind of setup scene where the the major is on the phone to the to the local general, mm-hmm. and there's a little bit of kind of plot being established here. But the, essentially, this is just to establish that the general is a bit of an intimidating guy, and that we're all supposed to be a little bit scared of him. Mm-hmm. We get we get some some straightforward plot stuff here and to say this isn't the first episode where we're establishing the character of the major or anything like that but he's reading a book about pigs he's obsessed with pigs that's his thing Mm -hmm. like he uses the opportunities he's at this cushy he's got a cushy job you know a post-war cushy position in nether hopping and he doesn't want to put it at risk which is again any sort of military based thing that's there's an upper class officer who's just trying to keep his head down it's exactly yeah. the same in ain't half hot mum it's like yeah. no god for god's sakes we don't get want to get sent up to the front lines <laughs> like let's we don't want to avoid yeah, that at all costs put, literally put our head above the parapet yeah, <laughs> yeah the, no the theatrical troupe is extremely important we need to look <laughs> after them i tell you what, what i noticed about this scene though alan um, is that we we get a, like a split screen so we got the major and the general are on the phone and there's a sort of transitional scene between the two where there's a mm. diagonal split screen and we yeah. see one in one corner, the other in the corner. I thought, I thought, well, that's, that's, that's interesting television work, especially for the time. Yeah. And bear in mind, this was all live transmission. Okay. All this, uh, certainly the earlier ones, mm. I think they all were, but certainly the oh, earlier Oh, sorry. Ones let me, were. let me clarify that. So I, I picked up just from a couple of stumbled lines that this was filmed as live. You're telling me it wasn't even filmed. It went out transmitted live. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, which wow, most TV did okay. back then. Yeah, that was almost all of it because recording okay, yeah, okay. it and then playing it was a a, a completely you know a, a, a whole extra layer of tech to do. Yeah, it was a yeah yeah. Okay, sorry. Go back to this uh, this split screen. Well, I I'm not familiar enough with the technology to tell you how it's done, but I I can sort of talk around it a bit mm. because. One thing I notice is when we switch we switch from a one shot of the major to the split screen. And it is a different camera. The 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 angle on the May just yes. um, just switches slightly. So it's definitely a different camera that they had set up with the split screen thing already kind of in place, ready to go. So the uh-huh. vision mixer can just click the button and it goes to it. And I'm not sure exactly how that's done. It might be some sort of iris like flag on literally cutting off half the camera so that you can overlay one on the other, like yeah. it, almost like a green screen. You know, it's like you. Sure. You black out one half of the screen, and then the other thing will come off it. I noticed as well that the the shot of the general is much brighter; it's more exposed than the mm. than the major. He's darker, so I, I think that might be part of it. Like one is overlaid on the other somehow. Okay, interesting. Not quite, but I'm, that's kind of just me piecing together what I can see. I don't really; I'm not familiar with the technology that well. But it's great, isn't it? Doesn't it look fantastic? Yeah, really impressive. <laughs> and for a phone call, you know, a split screen phone call, it's a classic way of doing it. Well, it's a classic way of doing it in, in you know, in films <laughs> and mm. uh, it, it, certainly in the modern day, you know. But I, I was really surprised. I was like, wow, okay, that's a that looks technically interesting, you know. Mm. And you don't see a lot of that in this show, to be fair. There's not a lot of no, examples of uh, stuff No, because like I, I mean. this is literally the first scene I watched of the army game. And I thought, oh, this is innovative. This is Citizen Kane. Wow. <laughs> and then it just didn't happen again. You know, nothing like that happened again through all the episodes I watched. <laughs> there was this, then, then, and this is where I was going to ask you about the live transmission thing. 
because there's this weird transition out of this scene. So he puts the phone down to the general. And then essentially what happens next in the action is that Bullimore comes in and uh, the major is talking to Bullimore. Yep. But there's a pause. There's like five or six seconds. And I don't know if, I don't know if William Hartnell's missed his cue or what. Yes, sir. Oh, blimey, that's tough. How the hell am I going to get out of that one? Oh, well, there we go. <clears throat> And then in walks and then in walks William Hartnell. I'm like, that's not scripted. That is not tight dialogue. <laughs> I don't know, did Hartnell miss his cue? What happened there? I'm not sure. I don't know. It's, it's I, I do find it very interesting. Like the it, it's obviously written with this in mind. You you will have a scene with the the boys in the in the in Hut Twenty Nine, and then it'll cut mm. to a scene with the sergeant major in the uh, you know in the major's in the major's office or whatever. Uh, like they've timed it. So that, okay, we go to this scene to buy us time because we're setting up for the next thing over here. Or like one actor will leave the scene slightly earlier because the next scene is them walking into another room or you're them doing something. So they obviously had to time the theatrical entrances and exits in in that way. It'd be very interesting to see the setup of the stages and everything because it was filmed in front of an audience as well. It's got a live audience. Uh, we do. We do also have you said, um, Bullimore, uh, uh, William Hartnell. He does come in covered in snow. Uh, we do oh, have yes, a lot of fake snow. snow in this episode. This episode went out on December twenty seventh, oh, uh, nineteen fifty seven. So obviously it was they were because you're filming and putting out that at the same time. You know you can be as topical as you want. I got a couple of notes on this. So my first note was fake snow, full stop, terrible, full stop. <laughs> but then about twenty minutes later, I've written a note which is this fake snow is quite charming. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it was like when when they were the outdoor scenes and they had the snow falling. It was obviously just some chump above the camera line. Yeah, there's one row, sprinkling there's one white like paper. layer of snow in like. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but it was it was. I found it rather endearing. It was terrible, but but it was sort of cute, <laughs> like a, like an Amdram theatre production of snow, you know. <laughs> so we go from there. Now we get our first scene in Hut Twenty Nine, where mm. we see our little troop of soldiers, and again, this, this is our first cast. And uh, you, you sort of immediately recognise some of these guys as some of the Carry On stars. So yeah. we'll, we'll talk. We'll talk around these. The first thing, first person we see is Charles Hawtrey, and he's knitting because he's a homosexual. You see, <laughs> because you he you know he's <laughs> one of them. Yeah, um, they, they do a lot of that. I mean, it's that's 1957 coding, isn't it? Like, you know, <laughs> it's not legal yet. But look, he's knitting. You know what we're saying. <laughs> you know, you, even your mother knows. Okay, so look, it's. <laughs> He knitting, he's knitting, that gets a bit of a laugh every time. And I, I was mm. wondering about this. I would have thought, if you're in the army or in the, you know, national service or whatever, like, as, even as a, like, being able to knit and sew and stuff like that was a useful skill. I don't think that would have been a particularly unusual thing. Maybe sewing. I'm not sure. I, listen, I, I'm, I'm not sure because my, my very brief, undistinguished army service was 30 years later. But you had a matron for that. If you need a sock darning or a sock sewing, you took it to a woman. That is what happened in 1992. <laughs> yeah, but that's because you were 16. <laughs> yeah, maybe. maybe. But I think in the army, in the trenches, you just, you had to kind of, those sort of skills would have been useful. Anyway, I don't like, they, I never, it, it's interesting because in the show, he's never belittled in any way, really, for his effects. No, uh, no, uh, absolutely behavior. Not. But also, the character is, his nickname is The Professor, because he wears glasses, <laughs> right, I guess. Yeah. Like in time, gentlemen, please, prof. <laughs> Remember when he won two quid? Or fact. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but the the thing is, when if you're going to call a character professor, presumably they're the brainy one. You know, they're university educated. Um, mm-hmm. But um, <laughs> but uh, he never really does anything where you go, oh, he's the one. We always go to him for ideas, anything like that. In the episodes I've seen, which is not that many, he's not like that. No, but he's also not written as the effeminate or the gay one or whatever. Not particularly. Yeah, he's quite camp. That, that that's because it's Charles Hawtrey. I think mm, maybe. I think they wrote the professor, hired someone with glasses, and it turned out to be Charles Hawtrey, so it became the gay one. <laughs> like I think. Okay. okay. I think give him, give him a knitting needle. <laughs> so it's kind of not quite been written in. <laughs> yeah, but yes, okay. it's in, right. it's interesting how that is shown and then yeah like i say he's not he's one of the boys it's it's not it's not really a factor and i think that goes mm-hmm. for all of them they're all they're this bunch of misfits but they they have a common purpose and they have a common they all like each other even when they're falling out so who else do we have there we have bernard breslaw 
who again you'll recognise from Carry On films, and he's playing that oh Sid Bernard Breslau <laughs> character that he always plays. He's <laughs> and, the stupid uh, one, yeah. He's the stupid one, yeah. So he's coded thick, and he's got a little pet mouse, and he's just an idiot. And this Bernard Breslau was quite young. He was born in 1934. Mm. So he was in his early 20s when they did this. And I wanted to ask you about that as well, because as far as I'm concerned, national service is something you do when you're like 19, right? So how come yeah. most of these guys are in their 40s and probably would have served during the war if they were fit and able? Yeah. <laughs> never, we never seem to question that. <laughs> yeah, that might be a problem. <laughs> I think that's just a casting thing, right? Well, by then, by then national, service, national service was basically a hangover from the war. Mm. Um, so conscription had started... Well, in 1939. But then, obviously, after the war finished, there was still national service. Hmm. We obviously know that people were called up during the First World War and conscripted. But then it happened again in 1939. And the idea was that anyone from the age of 18 to 41 was eligible, was liable to be called up, is the expression they use. And there were exceptions, like for our family. Uh, our family were all coal miners. And so people hmm. in those reserved occupations, they called them, wouldn't be called up. Hmm. Bevan boys. Bevan boys are a little different. So, so our family and other families who lived where we came from were coal miners, so weren't called up. The Bevan boys were people who, from elsewhere who were called up, but rather than serve in the war, they served in the coal mines uh, uh, because, because the, that we needed because the country that, needed more coal. That, that, was, that was part of the war effort, you know. So then, anyway, after the war, people weren't really demobilized straight away after the war. They started to demobilize, but it took a long time to get back down to peacetime levels. So people were still mm. being called up, you know, to sort of mop up in, in, in Germany and so on. But 1948 was when the National Service Act uh, came in. And at that point, anyone from 17 to 21, they had to serve 18 months. Uh, and then they would go onto the reserve list for a, for a number of years after that. But, you know, like World War II was done, but Britain still had still plenty of poorly armed brown people to oppress as we, mm. uh, um, as we, uh, I think they Desperately call it decolonization. Desperately hang on to the emperor. <laughs> decolonization <laughs> is, the, is the term that we use now 50 years later. But decolonization was a pretty messy and bloody business at times. But having said that, the, the, so you, you would be called up for your national service. I, I'm really not sure how a decision was made in, ter in terms of where you went. You know, could you choose? I'd like to go to Kenya to kill people. No, I'll just, I'll just serve in the logistics corps, please. Probably not. <laughs> I, I dare say you were told where you had to go. But I, I suspect that for the majority of young men, and it was men, the army game was probably a closer approximation to their service than mm. you know, some people did serve and fight and see action. But, but I think in the main, particularly in later years, this this probably would be a fairly relatable experience. Mm. And it was almost like doing your prison time, you know, you just had to not count off the days. And, uh, yeah. To some extent, but I, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, my, my concept of national service is almost like what I think of as the university experience now. It's like it mm. gets you out of this little village, this little kind of yeah. narrow band that you live in. It's going to introduce you to other people and different skills and, and trades and potentially open doors for you, even if it's just literally you've learned a trade. Well, see the world, travel, meet new people, kill them. <laughs> yes. That, that's the problem. That's the problem with <laughs> it. You know, yes, the, I, uh, I went to Malaysia. It was wonderful. Thing, yeah. I killed so many people. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think when people go, oh, bring back national service, that's what they mean. Uh, I think there's perhaps, yeah, slightly less murderous ways of doing it. Of I'm doing, not sure it is. I think, when, I think the sort of people who say bring back national service, they want young people to be more disciplined. They don't want them to see the world. They don't want them to have great experiences. They want them to shut up. They want them to be shouted at by William Hartnell. Incidentally, the Bring Back National Service Brigade, like national service ended in 1960. So yeah. if, you, sir, if you did national service, you were born 1942 at the latest. That makes you 80. Now, in my experience, the people who say Bring Back National Service are not in their 80s. They're in their 50s and 60s. And they've got no idea what that means. <laughs> Did their parents no harm? Their alcoholic father well, exactly. who hit them all the time didn't, didn't do anything yeah, any harm? exactly. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah. I, my, do you want to know my, my national service, uh, my bring back national service um, idea? A little bit of politics. I worked in my 20s, I worked in retail. And I think everyone should do six months in customer in service. Either working in retail <laughs> or working in a bar or just, just dealing with people. I think it would do them a world of good and it would make people more patient in shops. 
<laughs> now idea. that is my that is my uh, that is my big political idea, but I'm not I, I'm not I'm not really ca- um, lobbying for a referendum. <laughs> you know, I'm not that I'm not that committed. To it. <laughs> I think economically that kind of happens to most people anyway, isn't it? You do six months working in the shop when you're a teenager. Oh, yeah. In the shops anymore. Well, that's the other thing. It might stave off Amazon for another <laughs> couple of years. <laughs> Anyway, a little bit of politics there. A little bit of poorly thought through and <laughs> incomprehensible politics. Let's get back to the episode. So we've, who else have we got on the hook? We said Charles Hawtrey and Bernard Breslau. So you've got who Charles got Hawtrey, Bernard Breslau and Norman Rossington we have here. Norman Rossington. Now, yeah, all these guys went on to do Carry On stuff. I think all of them appeared in a, another show called Our House as well, which was made in the early 60s which was about a bunch of misfits who lived in a house together. It's got most of the carry-on regulars in it. Right. Uh, like what you, and then that was after the carry-on films had begun. So, you know, it was not completely unconnected. It's not completely coincidental or anything. Uh, Norman Rossington, yeah, he, he went on to be a f- in a few carry-on films, never quite was one of the regulars. But one of those faces you recognise, you know. You I, I certainly recognised him. I recognised him from one of the Sharp films, because I love Sharp. Uh, <laughs> I love <laughs> yes, Sharp yes. So I recognised him from that. But 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 he was he was in the early carry-on films, wasn't he? But the sort of black and white ones, the early days. I think so, yeah. Definitely some of those. Yeah, he was in, like I say, he was in that group in the early 60s. Mm. Uh, he was in Curry and Chips in 1969, of course. He was a regular in that. Oof. There's <laughs> quite a few Spike Milligan connections with people involved here, the writers yeah. and stuff, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Charles Hawtrey is interesting. I was looking him up. He's, you know, acting mm. since he was a child. He was a boy soprano. Okay. Uh, always seemed to specialize in comedy. Was a, he was a sort of a, a stooge for Will Hay in a lot of his stuff. Yeah. Uh, real kind of old school kind of variety comedy stuff. The Army Game, again, that's the same for all these guys. The Army Game is the thing that kind of boosted their profile yeah, quite considerably, yeah. made them much more well-known, and in Charles Hawtrey's case, sort of pushed him into the, the carry-on gig, which is what became his bread and butter. And then, because of the whole, you know, alcoholism thing, never really did a lot of other stuff, you know, he never quite developed into anything else. But like I say, a lot of these yeah. guys, you know, a lot of these guys got a big boost from their career from the show, but they were also in their forties already, so it's not like. Um... Well, you say that's an interesting question. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going off at a tangent here. How big was this? You know, this was a big boost for them all. Yeah, it was. Was it this was, huge, was this yeah. huge? Yeah, and I, um, I think the second series got switched to like Friday evenings. You know, that was it was mm. switched to a more prime time slot because it was so popular. You know, and even after the first cast left, it's it does. I mean, they they got a few more years out of it. That that second cast, the second wave, they are not the same, quite the same household names. But I think that's mm. because if I said to you the name Charles Hawtrey Be- Bernard Breslau, you're thinking Carry On. That's why they're famous. Sure. If they hadn't, yes, if true. that hadn't happened, which was a bit of a weird just thing that happened. Would you know these guys? Oh, it's that guy in the army game. Oh, yeah. It'd be like Norman mm. Rossington. You know, oh, yeah, I've seen him in a few things. Yeah, I know. I kind of know his face. Yeah. But the, yeah. the carry on has given them a, a life well beyond that. You could say the same about William Hartnell, couldn't you? He's Doctor Who. He's not yeah. Bullimore. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But, you know, it's not coincidence that these guys went on to do other things and, and were famous because, you know, they've brought together a nice little bit of talent here. Do you have a little bit of background on Bernard Breslau for us? Yeah, obviously he was a, a the young a younger man there, so this was very much his big break. Yeah. He actually got a scholarship to go to RADA, so you know that's how he he found his way. And all these guys are working class kids. Like I think that like mm-hmm. we, today acting is middle class, and there's there's yeah. great s- efforts to try and bring working class voices back into the performing arts but back then it wasn't a good job it wasn't a well-paid job it wasn't a stable job it wasn't a respectable job so Mm. they're all working class guys who are doing it because and it was a hard life you know you're working in rep and and living in some crappy digs some slums in in, like around theatrical world and you know they're all alcoholics that does come up a lot doesn't it i mean that does that it's like it's like um, all the jazz musicians of the thirties just just on heroin, just all on heroin. <laughs> <laughs> like the Carry On guys, all drunk all the time. <laughs> but yeah, but with Bernard, and Bernard Breslau, you know, he, he this character made his name and he was very famous for it. You know, and they did the whole thing with like novelty singles and all that sort of stuff. And yeah. he he played this character basically the same character by a different name mm. in quite a few films and even the carry on films mm. he tends to be the big stupid one he's six foot seven or something you know he's like a yeah. he's a big he's stupid a big dope bloke 
Yeah, exactly. And he plays it really A galoot. Well. When I was five, I asked me mum, Oh, won't you tell me, please, from where did baby come? You come from heaven, don't you know? I said, I thought I come from Bo. I only asked. I only asked. And he died quite young, you know, he, he, well, relatively young. He was less than 60. He had a heart attack, you know. It's like not, okay. perhaps not that surprising in the health mm. of these guys. But uh, the only other sort of sitcom I could think of him that he was a regular in was Man's Best Friends in the 80s. It was a Fulton Mackay vehicle, a sort of post-porridge Fulton Mackay okay. vehicle in which he was a regular cast member. Fulton Mackay makes an appearance in the Army game, by the way. He's in one episode, a young, a oh, young really? Mackay. Yeah. So uh, conspicuous in his absence there is Michael Medwin, and he's not in this episode. So I'll just have a quick okay. quick mention of him because he is yeah, in most please. of this first episode. He plays the corporal, so he's like the the schemer. And we'll we the episodes we've seen later with Flogger Hoskins. That's that's the it's basically exactly the same character, the same Co- character. cheeky Cockney Spiv type guy. He's the schemer. Yeah. And you'll see in this episode that Alfie Bass's character has to kind of, he's the one that comes up with the plans and all that sort of thing. So that's the Michael Medwin role. And Michael Medwin, you know, not someone I'm particularly familiar with. Um, He, in later life, he became a producer, did film and theater more like behind the scenes. The only other sort of regular sitcom role, he's, he's a regular in Colin Sandwich, which was a Mel Smith I remember, in the, in the I, I remember it very vaguely. I remember watching it, but yeah, one of the Michael Medwin, one of those people who was in a lot of things, uh, but not really kind of doesn't jump out at you. And yeah, I I couldn't quite I couldn't mm. quite place him or any or with anything specific. But yeah, again, this was the role that sort of uh, pushed him pushed him forward. Uh, uh, but then yes, let's talk about the other cast member that we get in this scene where we establish all our privates. Alfie Bass playing Bootsy or excused boots Bisley. So he doesn't wear boots because of his bad feet. Uh, therefore, he's bad he is known as his bad plates and me. Cut me rhyming slang alert. <laughs> yeah. Um, and therefore, he's known as excused boots or Bootsy for short. And yeah. this character is probably the most interesting because it's the one that runs throughout the two main Yeah, it's interesting. Changes. Well, you know, before we talk about the character. Why didn't Alfie Bass go into the carry-on films? Why did he stay on, in the army game when everybody else moved on? I wonder what I wonder what the mechanism was there. It's a good question. I'm not sure. And and the problem is this swap over of cast wasn't even a very clean thing. I don't think it was. Like no, it I'm sure. In, in, I I can't quite. It's difficult to get the information, but I'm sure in series two they're kind of swapping between William Hartnell and Bill Fraser as as the sergeant major character. Mm. That Snudge character was that we come we're going to come to later was established before William Hartnell left. I can't quite work out if that was just like whenever one wanted a week off, the other one would fill in or whatever yeah, it works. But but yeah, there there was this kind of exodus. I'm not quite sure why that was and what spurred that. Maybe it was Carry On Sergeant. We'll talk about that in a bit. But Alfie Bass, yeah, he's not really in the carry on films i don't think he's in them at all is he certainly not in a significant any significant way yeah i mean you may he may have been in one or two i don't i don't know but he's not a carry on. he's not part of that carry on crew is he mm. but why is that i don't know he stuck with know. the show it's got to be a good solid job you know it's like why why is adam woodjack in eastenders after 40 years you know mm. some people move on and try and do something else some people go oh i'm all right with this it's just paying the bills um, but Alfie Bass, yeah, born in 1916. Uh, he was the youngest of 10 children. How about that? Wow. <laughs> so probably desperate for attention. Uh, yeah. and, always, <laughs> and always was interested in acting. Um, one of, another one of those where his career really only set off kind of after the war. He appeared in an Oscar winning film in uh, uh, 1957, uh, uh, a film that won Best Black and White Short Film. <laughs> he, was, he was in that. <laughs> Very good. And he was really, he was just your classic quintessential character actor. He, 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 he Throughout his entire career, he would turn up in small roles in something, never really the lead, you know, just a supporting character, but always. A solid. We a saw solid him choice, until yeah. Death Has Do Part, didn't we? Yeah. Um, the latest was, series, the color series. Yeah, yeah. He came up in Are You Being Served as well for mm. a brief, brief ride in that. What, what I found interesting as 
as the the show progresses that that character does change a little bit i think um he becomes more childlike and slightly yeah. naive in the later series yeah i didn't i didn't i've got to be honest i didn't like the character this is obviously the breakout character bootsy and snudge mm. but i i didn't he didn't i didn't want to him he didn't didn't have many endearing features he just seemed a bit yeah childlike's good he seemed a bit stupid and annoying <laughs> <laughs> yes. So obviously in the early incarnation, Bernard Breslow is the stupid one. And yeah. that is replaced quite directly with um, Ted Loon in the later series. But Alfie Bass's character, he, yeah, he's not st- he's not the stupid one. It's childlike. There's a sort of naivety to him, but also it's, yeah, this real... And he looks up to Snudge as a sort of weird far- stepfather who, you know, sometimes mm. he hates him, sometimes he loves him kind of weird thing going on. It's... And, you know, this is a 45-year-old man as well doing this, so it all just has a bit yes. of a weird vibe about it. Yeah. But I, I quite like what he does. I think there's a real charm to it, and especially in the later series. I think it is missed in the very last series where he does leave. There's, it's just a, a force of personality, I think. Uh, he, he's, he, has his ca- he has a catchphrase. Does he? he his catchphrase is, <laughs> still, never mind, eh? <laughs> 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 well, still no mind. <laughs> he also getting towards the len- towards the end. He starts. He starts going. <laughs> I've watched seven episodes. I don't. That, that hasn't jumped out. At me. <laughs> he definitely does it. Um, <laughs> towards the end, he starts going Ooh-ah, a lot. Like whenever. But this is what. Let's Ooh-ah. have that again. Ooh-ah. <laughs> Ooh-ah. <laughs> but I do like it. I like what he's doing, and I think he does sort of fit into something slightly different in the later episodes. It does It does become something different. Well, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for right now, but do come back next week when we will continue our look at the episode and then go on to look at the later cast of the Army game and all the changes that came with that and the kind of legacy of it all. Thank you very much for listening. If you'd like to check us out on social media, we are at BritcomPod on Twitter and Instagram. You can find us on Facebook if you search for British Sitcom History Podcast. Thank you very much, and we will see you next week.